Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, the amazing Jose Leitao returns to the show to update us on his Ninth Gate-style Cyprian quest across Portugal and to talk to us about his latest book, Biblioteca Valenciana, out from Hadean Press. Jose, welcome back. Uh, thanks for having me back. Uh, I, I realize I'm one of the select few recurrent guests, so that's a, that's a big thing. That's an honor. Well, you keep uh, you keep having amazing adventures and 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 turning <laughs> them into books. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yes. Yes. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think maybe we should start there because I'm uh, I'm one of your Patreon supporters, and you've been on uh, something of a Cyprian quest of late. If you want to kind of tell people what you've been up to uh, in in that sense, it's been the most fascinating newsletter to get. I have to say. <laughs> uh, well, you're, you're very kind. Um, so the the whole thing is it's kind of a long story. It started a really long time ago. Uh, actually, uh, you know, I published the first book, the first book of Saint Cyprian, and during during the time I was already finishing it up, doing the revisions with the Hadians, uh, I actually started finding and collecting very small, like little pieces of information and tiny publications, which had to do with Cyprian. Um, and for a while, I really didn't know what to do with them. Should I just try to publish this this stuff like independently? Do I group this together? Do I do something with this? And then eventually that just started growing until I found um, uh, basically uh, the a, a manuscript book of Saint Cyprian in a, an undisclosed location, and um, from that point on, I just decided to okay, might as well take this seriously because something serious is seems to be happening here um and and yeah that's that's where the idea came from so i decided to seriously invest some time and money into a new project but as i researched more and more what what to do with with these elements that i had collected i started realizing that there was a whole universe of underground publications, um, small um, pamphlets, and, and lots of material out there in just libraries everywhere that did need a lot of attention. So that's where the idea of the Patreon came. That's, uh, I, it, it was a bit too much for me to take on myself. Um, so if anybody would like to help me travel the country and bother library clerks, uh, you send me your money. That was basically it. <laughs> well, it's been, I mean, you have been all over the country already. I mean, it's been really interesting to, you know, some of the trips, as is the case with this sort of research, some of the trips are disappointing. Some of them are really exciting. Uh, it's uh, it's really helped for me anyway, kind of get a picture of what both the sort of non-physical version of the Book of St. Cyprian, as, or the immaterial, to use the term mm. from another of your books, uh, how that has kind of lived in Iberian culture, as well as the actual um, physical documents, where it and the practices that kind of fall under that name have showed up. Uh, yeah, and there are, there are several aspects that, uh, until um, a long and in-depth investigation has been done, which is what I'm doing right now, that, that have really been invisible up until this point. And that's still information that I'm not really sure what to do with. Because things that... So, you, you, I mean, you, you read the material mm -hmm. uh, book. So you have those aspects of folk culture. Um, but then you start having... You find geographical patterns. Like, there is a particular type of book that comes up in this region systematically. And there's a different kind of book that comes up in this region and how these relate with each other. Um, and how does one version of the book travel into the next version? So there's a whole uh, genealogy and a whole network and connection between books that I'm still piecing together. And I'm not sure all of this will be able to fit in the book that I'm working on right now. That might be something for a bit later. But it promises very interesting avenues 
for uh, dissemination of information and ideas and uh, immaterial concepts. Yeah, it's it's also, uh, I want to ask you about the regional stuff in a minute, but it's also across time. From memory, some of the documents you looked at were 20th century, so it's not even not even that long ago. No, no, that's true. Uh, the 20th century stuff is probably the most, the, what I've been finding the most, obviously it's printed, it's uh, slightly easier to track. Um, but still, even in that period, um, and, and this, you, you do have to, to understand that, that particular period of Cyprian literary production, you do need to have some understanding of the underlying social and political issues happening in the country at the time, uh, which I try to explain in the book in a very long and potentially boring chapter on politics. Context is not uh, boring. Uh, wait until you read that one. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, but you, at least in, in terms of the printing, uh, of the printed stuff, um, there are at least two different axes of, of production. One centered in Lisbon and the other one in Porto. So the two, two major cities. And, uh, and you can uh, distinguish the stuff that's being produced in one side or the other. So that's something, and, and it has to do with you know, social evolution where, where, everybody, where everybody just starts congregating and where was political and ideological debate happening. And with political and ideological debate, you do have um, increase in uh, publishing press, in, in uh, periodicals and publications of um, political and ideological dissemination. And magic and occultism kind of jumps on board with that. Yeah. I, um, I've been meaning to tell you, I actually bought some bone dice uh, off eBay, some early 20th century bone dice. Uh, oh, okay. But, but there isn't a Tuesday with a full moon in Australia till April. So, <laughs> so they're sitting here waiting to be activated. But I, I think it's been – and in, in a way, it's kind of – it's all the one project, really. I mean, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the book we're about to talk about. It, it's kind of all the one um, – it's, it's all the one – Cyprian meets the Ninth Gate sort of uh, project through kind of culture and, and folk Catholic mysticism, isn't it? What, what, what do you mean, like the, the, well, the, the several the, publications? Yes, exactly. And, and, and the journey looking at these documents and so on. You're kind of looking at... Uh, well, it's my impression. It feels like the one project. Like, I really enjoyed Immaterial Book of St. Cyprian because it kind of provided really interesting uh, context for... Um, what a document can mean or do in a culture, even without the document. And so it's, it's sort of that. Um, and the fact that that notion of the book of St. Cyprian and, and, and his kind of uh, rulership over things like magic survives into the 20th century. It's a, uh, it's all that kind of one quest, I guess. Uh, yeah. Look, the, everything I'm doing, and probably will be doing in the future. It's it's all it's all one thing, really. Um, I started this off by translating and publishing the what right now in this point in time specifically what is the book of Saint Cyprian. That that's our our contemporary version. That's what I published first. Uh, but then you know the the topic isn't exhausted there in any way. Um, and uh, and if you do care about that book, and if you research the book, and you want to understand it, it, it raises more questions than, than it answers. So it's all been since that time um, trying to piece everything together to see how how does this one book make sense, and what what were the backgrounds, and what were the literary evolutions and cultural aspects that make this one thing show up in this time. Um, and, and that's basically uh, uh, that, that's a, that's a life's quest, I suppose. Yeah, it is. Well, part of it's in part of it is sort of in the latest book. Uh, so, am, am I going to pronounce it correctly if I say Biblioteca Valenciana? Uh, that's good enough. Don't worry. Yeah, it's good enough for an Australian. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, let's start with that. What what does the title refer to? Um, basically, it's. Um it comes from two two different things. First off, 
It's a collection of writings from a particular author called Jeronim Cortez, who was a, a Valencian author, and he stresses that constantly. He's a gentleman or a knight of Valencia, and um, uh, there's um, some personal aspects in the book, and, and they're all about Valencia. So he, he, when he wants to give a good example of something that relates to what he's talking about, he tells you a story about Valencia. So there's that. So it's uh, because he's a Valencian, a proud Valencian. So let's just call it Biblioteca Valenciana because it's uh, basically a collection of his writings, the writings of a man from Valencia. But then there's another aspect to that. And, and this is a Portuguese specific problem um, that this author was frequently called in Portuguese publications as the Valencian. Um, and so the, I just put those together and just called it the, the Biblioteca Valenciana. That's about it. And um, when you say it's his writing, he, uh, so Cortes, appears to have been uh, a collator, uh, an intelligent man, obviously, but like a, a collator of, uh, and an analyst of earlier documents. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, on the the ones I collected, because um, in all honesty, I didn't collect all of his writings. His first publication is um, a lengthy mathematical treatise, um, which is his original. Uh, but it's 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 so boring, it's so awful um, that I, I decided uh, this is uh, very tangential to what the point I want to make with this guy. So I'm I'm keeping that out. But all his other material um, is a lot of it is um, repacking of several classical authors and some of them, even his contemporaries, into basically, let's say, a distillation of large amounts of academic knowledge into a form which is consumable by slightly lower classes of society. Yes, yeah, so I, I made some notes as I was reading through it. We could call him uh, almost a popular science writer of his day. Yes, totally, yeah. Although I, I have to say that uh, his first book, The Lunarium, which is the, the what he claims to be um, a perpetual almanac, so that he gives you a few formulas and a few tables and you can continuously calculate um, astrological predictions and weather predictions through hundreds of years that I get the feeling is largely his original work because he was a mathematician first of all. Oh, I have questions waiting like you, you didn't, and I think it was obviously the right decision because no one wants to read a um, 18th century maths textbook, but uh, you can tell Lunario was written by a mathematician It's uh, yeah, it, it, it has that kind of mindset all over it Oh yeah, yeah. But it's it, it's a mathematician, but it's a mathematician inserted in a particular culture, uh, and it's um, all all. Uh, and this is a uh, a general observation. All of his literary production, all of pretty much everybody's literary production at that time, was obviously inserted in a particular idea of the cosmos and the place of religion and the functioning of religion and spirituality in that cosmos. So it's a, it's a mathematical treatise on how to operate spiritually on an ideal level. Yeah, and I think when we say he's a popular science writer, what, that, what I mean by that is he had the mind to look at more complex texts or create them himself, so earlier or more complex texts, and then he formulated them in a way, and you write about this in the introduction, so we'll, we'll make this a question. You write about them in a way that makes it, it gives quite good evidence that people in uh, less literate or, or maybe lower or middle classes were interested in the same stuff, like a like a popular science book. Every every decade or so, there's a there's one where some smart man or woman can turn around and make these ideas popular because there is that interest in in the wider populace. Uh, yeah, yeah, and in particular, he he's a very much at the at the um, social and historical transition period. Where you start getting new, uh, a new emergent middle class and uh, an increase in, uh, in literary awareness, 
and people just wanted access to this information. It's it's uh, it's just yeah, it's a popular science writer is a very adequate way of, of referring to this guy. He was just responding to a demand by by new social classes. Was uh, the Lunario the most popular? Yes, by far. Uh, it's still considered the most successful Spanish book ever. In Spain, outside of Spain, it's it's one of the most widespread pieces of, of literature, of Spanish literature ever produced. It's, uh, I mean, we, we have to talk about it now. So Lunario, obviously, it refers to the moon. And as you said, it's, it's a perpetual almanac. Uh, but what it, that, what that essentially means is, yeah, he gives you these tools so that basically wherever you are, uh, in time or place, it, it, it's remarkable. It begins with kind of the creation of the universe and then moves down into smaller segments of time and, and allows you to calculate everything. Like, um, what, what day is Easter going to fall on in, in, in 2089? Uh, and it's, it's an amazing document, but, uh, I mean, yeah, kind of describe its its shape in that sense. Um, so, yeah, look, the, the, the shape of the Lunario itself is not revolutionary. Uh, you have plenty of books just like that. But what makes the Lunario um, unique in itself is, again, a focus on a particular social class. So from that standpoint, Cortés really... Um, I wouldn't, he, he really just breaks it down, breaks down um, according, of course, to religious and canonical authors. So what is, what is time? What is the, the creation of the universe? How does time fit into this? How can you divide time? And he just divides it in smaller and smaller sections, explains what every um, division of time signifies and how... Um, the the um, the universe functions by these sections of time, and how the human human life also fits into this scheme of 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 a, of a circle of time, and how um, sections of the human life and um, how that that works with the um, four seasons, for example, the four winds, how everything in the universe can be fitted to this to these schemes of smaller or larger partitions and then he basically just gives you a whole bunch of information a whole bunch of tools on based on this on this basis of of knowledge how from from this to calculate everything how how do these um sections of the universe can be calculated based on these partitions of time uh, and this then expands to every basic aspect of what reality would be perceived as at that time. Religious reality, how to predict the weather, how to predict disease, how to cure disease, how what to plant when and how and what to do with particular sections of the yearly calendar. How do saints fit into this? What's the influence of saints? Um, it's just... Um, a, a practical description of a um, attainable control of the universe, I think you would call it. And it's, uh, I mean, because I was a bit intimidated uh, thinking, goodness, I'm, I'm reading a 18th century mathematician's book, but uh, I can do it. So you, you, this is, I mean, you said it's, it's not that remarkable for its time uh, or that there are other books like it. I kind of think it is because it's weirdly specific. It goes from the four winds down to where you place your wine cellar. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's how you embed this kind of notion of, of time and place into your life. And I could follow it. And that was amazing. I, I mean, and obviously because it's popular, that makes sense. But, uh, uh so the question was, as I was reading it, I started thinking about the impact something like uh, Agrippa had on, um, you know, German and English folk magic, where it kind of, rightly or wrongly, organized some beliefs and practices that were already existing, but because you're dealing with either non-literate or, or lower-class people who don't show up in history – 
you don't really see them. And then there's this book that kind of organizes it. And and do you, do you get the impression that uh, the Lunario does something like that? It's this mixture of herbalism and and astrological timing and and um, agricultural best practice and and so on. So all this stuff was going on. Did, was it? Is the genius in it that it was this kind of framework? Yes, yeah, I, I believe that in, uh, um, completely. It's really um, look. The, the book was essentially uh, targeting uh, farmers, um, and this is not to say that farmers are supposed to be dumb, but it's uh, some of them are dumb, um, and it was really built to offer uh, the, this this functioning hold, this functioning. Uh, structure of the universe for very basic, uh, in, in very basic principle, just a systematization of how does the universe work and how can you optimize your work within this, and also how how this whole thing really um, comes together in, in, in ideally at this period is precisely the religious angle. That not only because a- any book, well, let's say Agrippa, a- a- every book, let's say on magic, needs to assert its authority. So he's describing a functioning of the universe, but w- what is this book to claim such a thing? What to me really drives the point home with Cortez is that he was describing um, essential Catholic functioning universe, which was already uh, not in a very systematic way but already part of the framework of the people who would be reading this so his book basically is um further powered by the prevalence of a very powerful catholic church um in in iberia and then wherever this book goes to um so yeah it's um Basically, this is me agreeing what 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 you just said. And the Catholic component is interesting because people listening to the show would be familiar with uh, calculating um, for ritual magic reasons um, the different rulerships of different days and and different hours and so on. And that's in there. But what he does, like as an example, what I found interesting is that he overlays events in the Bible onto those days. So you'll you'll know that Sunday is sun and obviously that's the busiest one. But different things that happen in the Bible happened on a Thursday or happened on a Wednesday. And it it's that uh, yeah, th- that's what kind of situates it and and brings it alive into this kind of Catholic universe on the edge of literacy because it seems like a when he says that the uh, immaculate conception happened on a Thursday. Uh, that's, you know, Jupiter or what have you. So that might be where it came from. But you can tell that that exists so that people can talk about it at the edge of literacy. So obviously someone would have had to have read the book, but it's situated in in uh, in a place where some people are literate and some people aren't. Um. Yeah, is that a question? Oh, no, I just I, I wanted to say to kind of support what you were saying that I hadn't seen that done before quite so competently that it it's um it's this yeah, precision no, I, I, timing I think, mechanism with I think the there, there's an, I think there's an aspect that sometimes we uh, <clears throat> living right now sometimes we um we don't fully realize when we're reading a book like this or even a book of magic um is that it it's not so much um about uh, a piece of information that somehow might or might not color your personal practice or your personal view of the universe. But this is a book like that, offering that kind of information. That was what people were living. That was their reality. And all of a sudden you are given a clarification on what your reality is. You know what Tuesday is, what Wednesday is, what Thursday is. You, you live these days, but what are these days? What as you travel through them, what do they signify specifically for your life, for your existence? And a book like this really helps power, um, uh, let's say, augmented living. Yeah, I, I think that's the right way of or, or augmented or um, deeper or living that tastes better because you, you kind yeah. of, it, it does, it does taste better when you're, 
um, when the world is filled with more of that magic, for want of a better word. But let's, like, I'll ask you a question then. How does it work? So this is the kind of genius of the Lunario in a way, but, like, what's the golden number and, and how it hinges on that? Um, well, basically, uh, that, that's basically the, the story of the, of the calendar. Um, so, you know, you know, you have just regular, the calendar day to day issues of 365 days, whatever. Um, but it's 365 days approximately. So when you try to expand this calendar, uh, to supposedly eternity. Uh, you will get gradual errors. You have leap days, you have centennials that, that work weird, and, and then if you try to fit certain religious ceremonies on very specific days that need to be somewhere between this moon and that moon and after this other thing that happens, this becomes very complicated. So there is, as time goes by, um, several mathematical mechanisms that need to be put into place in order to make a calendar effectively repeatable. And the golden number is the first of these. I think the golden number comes up in Roman times already. Um, and it's basically a set of, if I remember correctly, 19 numbers which repeat themselves every, every 19 years. And it's just an extra layer to the Gregorian calendar to make it, um, let's say, a little more articulate that every number will have a very specific uh, mathematical influence on the calendar. And then as time goes by, people realize, okay, the golden number isn't enough. So above this, then you have the dominical letter, which basically refers to the day of the week where the year begins. And depending on the dominical letter, then you have another set of mathematical rules. And then this isn't focused on the early editions of the Lunario, only on the later ones, which I add as, as appendixes. Then you have the Epact, which is another set of numbers that you need to put on top of all of these with new mathematical laws to make it, hopefully, the, to make the calendar gradually more and more precise and more and more cyclical and more and more predictable. So that's basically what those are. And I think, I mean, that was the bit that I could follow. Like, I think he, this is how you turn it into a, a sort of popular science book, because he basically, the way the Lunario is structured, as I understand it, you just need to calculate the golden number for the year that you want, probably the year you were in, or the one that's coming up. And if you have that and the letter, the rest of the stuff that he has in there um, you can pretty much calculate off that. So it's this kind of, and I mean, Easter, different saint days, um, you know, um, when to start looking. The moon, eclipses, uh, just pretty much anything. All yeah. of that kind of stuff. So it's, and that's, that's the genius of it. That's where you can kind of give that to someone who can go, right, you just need to learn this little mathematical trick to work out what the day, what the, what the you know, the golden number is. And once you've got that, you can, you can basically build an entire Catholic society anywhere in the world. And it, it kind of has that, um, it, it kind of has that Iberian Empire feel to it, which is like you can just drop <laughs> someone off in South America with this book and, uh, and they can literally recreate the, the entire universe that they came from. Yeah. And another thing is that um, the way that this is given in the Lunarium, it's, um, they, I mean, they, he just drops the dominical letter and the golden number in there, like like black boxes. He's not telling you what's, what's all the mathematical implications behind this. He just says, look, just th there are these things. Don't worry where they came from. Don't worry about what these actually mean. But if you use them in this way or in this way, then you get to calculate all of these things. Yeah, and it, it's that's what I mean. I could follow it. It was brilliant. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I live in the Southern Hemisphere. So what he does, uh, which I love, is it's not just because, and, and you talk about this, and we'll, we'll we'll discuss it in a minute. But it, the difference between it and say um, a ritual magic book or a grimoire or a manual that has the days and the hours for you know um, ceremonial magic, uh, it actually has information about the seasons and and he kind of pulls in from Pliny and Palladius and and all these people to 
once you've kind of calculated your year, you also know what happens if the first lightning and thunder comes in April rather than May. And, and the whole thing works in this framework. So this is the bit where it's kind of embedded in real life. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, I live in the Southern Hemisphere, so I, I wonder what will happen if I just completely reverse the months and uh, and look at what the signs and portents are otherwise probably not very much um because i suspect some of those are based on the ap- atmospheric effects of the mediterranean and the atlantic but uh, it's just this remarkable kind of unfolding like george jetson's briefcase of a <laughs> of a whole system yeah and and of course if you're um if you're a contemporary reader and practitioner you you can expand this you can keep going that was actually my point with the the essay I published in the Third Conjure Codex, which is th- this is this is a basic thing. This is just a, a very um, distilled and clear exposition of how the universe functions for uh, a 17th century Catholic. But you don't have to restrict yourself to this. You can just keep on fitting everything you want into this framework and create uh, um, a coherent universe. Yeah, but but actually, actually, I, I would be not that you because there are some editions of the Lunario published in in America in South America that do shift the calculations and everything to another continent. But it's a good point that um, I would actually be very curious about observing something of this nature in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, how 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 would that work? I, I'm not I'm not saying you should write that, but. Um, I didn't mention this before we started recording, but I actually just bought um, a small farm in southern Tasmania. So oh, wow. I am, I'm genuinely <laughs> I'm genuinely going to be on farm to see if what happens when I reverse the months. So I'll let you know. That would be very interesting, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll keep a document of that. And let's talk about, I mean, because the Lunario is, is, um, is the hero book. Uh, in in the yeah. collections, um, although I will talk about treaty in a second. But there um, is physiognomy part of Lunario, or is it part of secrets? The that, that's the second book. It's called Physiognomy and Various Secrets of Nature. Yeah, uh, um, you can find this. <laughs> I think only you would bring out a book like this, Jose, um, because obviously you can kind of work out people's traits and, and personality types and, and things from what they look like and whatever. And as everyone does when they get a book like this, I went and looked myself up and uh, I have Saturn in the 12th where it's joyous and exalted. So <laughs> the hideous physical description <laughs> of someone who has that, I'm like, well, that's basically me. Uh, and like, Oh, yes, I wrote this one down. So the thickness of and hair on my legs means I am inconstant and of average cunning, which uh, seems tough but fair. Constant and average cunning. Okay, that's not bad. Well, inconstant and average cunning. At least, uh, inconstant, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically I'm, I'm not very smart and not very reliable, and that's based on <laughs> the hair on my thick legs. And I loved it. It's the most remarkable kind of snapshot of... You know, how people, and it's, it's weird, like it's kind of like anywhere else in the world. By and large, thin, attractive people are nice, <laughs> and people who yeah, might much. be less so. <laughs> um, yeah, then, um, look, I, I, I when, when you're doing this kind of work, you, you have to leave your personal, some of them, your personal, um, tastes or, or whatever, a little bit aside, I, I personally, I, I find them interesting. I do not enjoy reading physiognomy treaties in any way, No, uh, which, which is problematic because Cyprian literature goes around this so much. Well, but it's a document of its time. So, of course, yeah. it's going to say things like that. I mean, it also lays into Muhammad in, in the next one and, and calling him dumb oh, for thinking, oh, damn, that, yeah. you know, like the world is on an ox and he's an idiot and all his followers are idiots and you think they would have worked it out. And he actually it, he goes on for some time about how dumb <laughs> Muhammad <laughs> and Muslims are. <laughs> Which, again, document of its time. Yeah, but, but I think the what to me... The, Look, the, the Lunarium and the Physiognomy, I actually considered at the time, because I knew this author, I discovered this author when I was working on, on the book of St. Cyprian. I did consider 
translating those two books at the time and add them as extended comments to that book. But that was already big enough. So I thought, nah, might as well just do this as a standalone thing. And the thing with the physiognomy and various secrets of nature. So it starts with a treatise on physiognomy, but then it goes on to basically expand a couple of topics which are brought up in the in the lunarium the divisions of of the elements and how does the um solar system work and the several spheres how the, all this works so it's an expansion on the lunarium a more detailed description of the universe and then at the end or not really at the end but uh, it has just a huge list of of natural secrets what you would call natural magic or medicine you can also call it um it's a pretty straightforward and, and simple book it's probably one of my favorite of the three the lunaria i'm not uh putting it down in any way it's a, a remarkable piece, piece of writing but um in terms of um i need something right now the lunaria demands a little more attention and a little more care while the physiognomy is really something that I need to do right now. And here's a possible answer for that. And I think some of them might seriously work. So I'm something of a, uh, I guess, keen gardener. Uh, and it writes in there, if you fumigate a carnation with sulfur, uh, you can turn it white. And you actually can, like carnations and roses and things. You can do that um, to ones that are different color and sulfur will turn them white. And it's in there saying, this is what you do. So I think there's one where it says you burn cumin. Um, to either kill or keep mosquitoes away, that I think will work. And I'm, I'm we're heading into summer here, so I'm actually going to try it because at last summer I experimented with lemongrass and neem to do a natural mosquito repellent. And neem has that same kind of complexity as cumin, so I bet you, mm. like, I think that one will work. And I, I see what you mean. Like the book is, it's kind of what people want or think of when they think of folk. I, I almost want to put magic in brackets, folk, brackets, magic, practices. Uh, it's that this is drink this goat's milk if you have this problem and, and uh, use uh, cumin and mosquitoes. And it's that really exciting blend of how to run a household and also kind of how to do magic. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, as a book of secrets, it's pretty much... Look, and I go into this in the in the introduction. I I can't see, and this is I'll admit it might be a postmodern opinion. Um, I I don't I, I can't honestly effectively make a distinction between certain types of grimoires like folk magic grimoires and a book of natural secrets. It's um, I I I don't see the distinction between them. So to me, that's Although the author might not have intended that book to be perceived as folk magic, as far as he knows, as far as he's concerned, that's, that's, that's science, that's how the universe works. But how this gets interpreted by his contemporaries and by everybody who comes after that is pretty much, uh, it starts functioning in a folk magic way. In such a way that, and this is not so much visible in the book of St. Cyprian, which is where the first reference to this author came from, that I found. But as you then move on in St. Cyprian literature, and you go into certain interactions of books of St. Cyprian in Brazil, and these small pamphlet publications, you get uh, an increase in um, reappropriation of material from Cortes in these books and like whole sections from the physiognomy put in a book of St. Cyprian with the specific title Magical Recipes of St. Cyprian. So there is a um, retroactive um, claiming of this material as being magic. Well, that's, see, that's very Agrippa. So he's, he's got the same thing happening to him that happened yeah. to Agrippa. So how does that, I mean, that was going to be one of the questions. This stuff uh, predates the uh, most popular flowerings of Cyprian literature, particularly to do with the Book of St. Cyprian. So when you talk about you're not seeing any difference between parts of a grimoire, so ones that look like this, and 
and sort of quote unquote folk medicine. Was there a difference? Do you think? Do you think the people of the day um, recognize the difference? Um, I don't think so. Um, look, the the categories categories of magic, science, and religion are are modern things, are almost contemporary, and and these are literate constructions with very little impact on um, the lives of just rural, regular folk, even if already literate. I, I don't think the distinction existed, and honestly, I, I still don't think it exists. Um, you're, you're talking simply about um, books that claim authority and who offer ways of functioning and solving problems within a certain uh, um, cosmological framework. That, that's simply what they, what they are, be it a medical treaty, um, a book of magic. It, it really doesn't matter. I, I don't think these were read any differently. No, so does that mean, I mean, can we even call it folk magic? Uh, is that kind of like a modern term for it as well? Can we Do we need to call it something like folk being in the world? No, look, uh, <clears throat> there are two problems with folk magic. One is folk and the other one is magic. <laughs> uh, because these are definitions that, like when, when you're, like, say, doing ethnography work, you can't go into any community and and ask, show me your magic. They'll probably not even know what you're referring to. Um, folk magic is a category in which, like, folk culture is, doesn't, any culture, isn't really structured like that. Um, a thing, something that you or me might call folk magic, when inserted in its cultural context, does not have that name. It's just something that people do. It's our background, our academic background, that labels it magic because by by a association of similarity or something. I don't know. Um, so yeah, the, the the whole category of folk magic is a completely academic construction. It doesn't exist in the environment where you're supposed to find it. Um, and I think that basically spells out a whole bunch of problems when uh, when you try to investigate folk magic. I use the term frequently because it's convenient. But I, I do have to admit that it has no intrinsic value when, when you're talking, when you're trying to understand things on a deeper level. So when we go to read books like this or whenever we see uh, the folk magic term, like... Um, how should we how do we solve that do we when we want to read about quote unquote folk magic in brazil or japan or chad uh, do we have to kind of go sideways and 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 try and understand as much as we can about the culture in which this stuff that we call folk magic happens to see if the term still applies is that what we need to do with this kind of stuff um, look, my, my solution to this problem, and this is something I'm, I'm dealing with right now, because based on some of the things I want to write in the future and a few projects that I've submitted, w whenever you want to study folk magic from a contextualizing concept, uh, uh, context, the, uh, the, my solution, I'm not saying this is the best, but my solution is, first of all, define for yourself what, what do you refer as folk magic. And I think that a very um, convenient, even if maybe excessively broad way of doing this is, and this is what, this is my definition, it's anything that doesn't fit into academic notions of, um, or high society notions or um, dominant society notions of uh, religion or academic medicine. Anything that doesn't fit that, I will classify as folk magic. And then you just go through, if you want to have books available, just go through all the ethnography you can find, all the various books on cultural analysis you can find, and anything that fits into this broad definition, you might just call folk magic and start collecting that. Uh, does this make sense? Yeah, I think that's remarkable, because it also... 
gives you the, the there are no shortcuts there are really no shortcuts if you want to extract something from a culture that is not meant to be extracted um those all those practices all things that we from the outside will call magic are not meant to be understood outside of their of their situation they, they don't have any reality outside of it so you do need to create a, some kind of category and be aware that you are creating this category that there is no reality to this I think that's um, if you're aware going in that that works because the other side of it is uh, if you look at this stuff um, because it does move it moves between cultures uh, but it mutates and becomes something so if you look at the the kind of component parts of Lunario they have or even the blue grimoires that kind of showed up in in, in Iberia to kind of at least dramatically activate the the Cyprian thing they exist you, you can kind of you have to stop the clock somewhere at some point in time to go, okay, well, this is what these components look like when they landed here. And I think if you have that wider definition, it means you don't end up pulling the wrong things out of, you know, like trying to transplant something wrong uh, elsewhere and, and, and kind of get lost in that. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, the, the final book uh, is, I mean, how much of this... I'm not. I, it's been a while since I've read Isidore of Seville. Uh, how much of the the final book, which uh, is very interesting, because I I have a copy of the Kiranidas and uh, I I I find it fascinating to look at bestiaries and and what the animals meant symbolically. But the the final book is essentially a very large bestiary. Uh, how did Cortez? Um, what were his sources for the bestiary? Uh, well, I would guess you know just. Uh, Pliny, um, you know, every Greek and Roman guy he can quote, he will quote. Um, but the the, um, the last one, the, the best year, the Treaty of the Animals, uh, one of the things that I find most remarkable about it is logically he, he has this background of classical authors, which he, he cannot escape and does not really want to escape from. But uh, given the particular time frame that this book was being constructed, uh, which, you know, you have the, the great booming of the Portuguese and Spanish empires, where you have all this new stream of scientific, zoological and botanical information, um, the, the bestiary strikes me as remarkable that on par with these classical authors, which at this point in time couldn't be counter-argued. You cannot say that these guys aren't valid. Uh, but on par with those guys, he's putting forward new ideas and new stories and new ways of, or new properties of these animals, of their several parts of how you can use this animal to do this, or this part of this animal that really isn't, wasn't even discovered until recently to do, to cure all these different things. So it's, it's, a, it's a transitional book, let's say, between pure classicism and something new of just uh, observable, experimented reality. No, I hadn't thought of it that way. I like that. Uh, it has it retains the kind of classical symbolism. I mean, it opens with the lion, uh, as you do, uh, uh, but it does exist at a time where these empires had holdings that included lions. Uh, it, yeah, you know, and also one of the things he does he, on, on every animal he describes, he offers stories of the animals, and a lot of them are just... I heard this story in Valencia, and it's just something that happened on the street from him. So what's he doing with that? Is this just him, you know, I say just, is this him doing pure popular science, or who's his target market for a treaty? That's a good question, because ultimately it was um, probably the least popular of his books. I think just had a, a couple of re-editions. Um... I would guess that uh, look, the, 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 that book doesn't stray from the ultimate point of the other books. It's just uh, a large part of it. At the end of every chapter on every animal, he just says what this animal is good for in terms of medicine. 
uh, how you can use this to cure basically anything. So it's still uh, based on a certain immediate preoccupation with well-being and how to uh, a certain rurality, but not not so much. Uh, so it's still, in a way, it's still a popular science book with practical applications. Um, the ultimate point with him in doing that, I'll, I'll admit, to sort of, that's that's a bit of a mystery for me because I can see where the lunario came from as a mathematician, and I can see where the physiognomy came from, which was an expansion of the lunario. But then this one, sure, you have some of the same preoccupations as the physiognomy, but the heavy, huge frame of let's describe all of these animals and offer these stories and what do classical authors say about that. It's, um, I'll admit, it's a little hard to make sense of this on a, on a purely continuity uh, level. Um, that is, escapes me. Yeah, you almost feel that he's trying to write a biology book 50 years too early. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Well, I mean, he's obviously he was obviously an extremely intelligent man, being a mathematician and, and being able to make this stuff a thing. Um, so he's either got a, a kind of project of, of, of organizing a magical universe, but in the way we're talking about it, not in a way for magicians. Um, or he's actually quite ambitious and as in intellectually ambitious and he's he's trying to feel his way towards something he wouldn't see in his lifetime obviously but the kind of books that would be coming like this is it's almost like as you say it's a transition period and it can't quite be the Kirinides or um, something from the past where each animal means this and here's its portent and this is what you combine it with under Venus to do this. But it's not quite at the level of, um, yes, uh, observational biology in, in sub-Saharan Africa or something. Really interesting. No, not quite yet. Yeah. I, I mean, I bet you it, as is usually the case with brilliant writers who... Uh, write some accessible stuff and some stuff that is less accessible. So Tolkien's favorite book, or he thought his best book was The Silmarillion. It's not his best book. But I bet you, with Cortez, it's the mathematical stuff at the beginning, which you rightly left out, and I bet you he really liked Treaty. I mean, <laughs> it's always the ones that kind of fall outside of it. They go, oh, these are my... Why doesn't anyone like my Treaty? And it's interesting because the Treaty, I, I actually translated this too, there was his widow actually made a huge fuss about keeping the publishing rights of the treaty with herself. So th there was some serious love for this book. I think it's in there. Maybe he just, you know, maybe he likes animals. Maybe that was a thing. Because you're <laughs> right, there are just these little stories. It's very affectionate. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, he's writing about, he's writing in wonder about the things that exist in creation. It's a very affectionate book. It was a really I wasn't I wasn't sure what to expect, but I I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's um it's um it, it um, I was also caught off guard by it. I I was because my main focus when I started working on this was just to my main focus was the two first books. Uh, and then that other one because it's a really huge book. I was a bit preoccupied with it, but uh, I ended up being kind of lulled into it um, with how the, um, yeah, how, how, yeah, like, like you said, he's, he seems to be fascinated with that. And, and there's such an interesting, unusual for us conception of what an animal is and how an animal behaves um, that you, you cannot help but feel a certain awe of, of really of creation like he did that he describes animals as having a kind of rationality on par with that of man but ultimately deprived of free will so you can engage with these stories about these animals as uh, on a very personal and intimate level like they're not that distant from you they're just this this manifestation of creation on a perfect idealized level that actually humans don't even have yeah, I think that's what it is. You get caught up in in his awe, in his reverence for creation, because he was obviously, you know, a um, if not 
religious as we'd use the term we'd use an even more modern term and say he's certainly a believer uh and certainly very devoted to what he believed in uh and you you kind of get that wonder of um i i, I was i found it quite uh affecting uh after the other ones where i just i'm rolling through the most fascinating stuff in a cool um something I could never do, like this fantastic mathematical artifice that means you literally can kind of just unpack a whole Catholic world somewhere else on the planet. And then you get to this and it's it's just lovely. Like the the, the little stories that, that, he, that he's collected. I think it's a, uh, I could, I'm glad, uh, Jose, that you gave him his own book rather than including the parts in um, Book of St. Cyprian, because I think I, I think he needs it, <laughs> uh, certainly for the Anglophone world. I'd, I'd never heard of him before um, reading this, obviously. Um, or I did, because we spoke about him about a year ago. But I think he needs to have his own stuff there. You get a real range of this person uh, by reading the book, I think, closely. Yeah, and um, I'm hoping that... Uh, maybe this will only become evident as as years go by, particularly if when I when I finish the new book, which is weeks away, hopefully, um, of how much of a um, fundamental author this guy is. Eventually, in, in time, time offers him this. He was very important when when he came up, but then as time goes by, he becomes gradually more important, even if his name gets dropped from the references. So you find numerous references to him, but not of his books, not his name anymore. And um, I hope that, yeah, it's, it's a worthwhile author in my perspective. It's a very, it's a very interesting guy to observe, to examine, to meditate on, particularly the insight he offers into his own time and his own social atmosphere. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, it, it's hard for me. It, I, I just, I really like the guy. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I think, uh, um, I think he's probably quite likable. Uh, just by, uh, everyone likes someone who's who likes animals, but uh, I think it's <laughs> it's amazing to me that um, I think you're doing really good stuff by bringing him out, and I appreciate because it's kind of mid project or even beginning of a lifetime's project that it's very difficult to articulate. I was trying to get at that myself when uh, at the beginning of the the show we were talking about how this stuff all fits into this kind of one world and uh and there's so much about it uh there's so much extra context and uh extra life by reading um biblioteca valenciana in conjunction with the other books because you just see it's it's like finding a gripper too late but he's better than a gripper i don't like a gripper stuff <laughs> uh it's just remarkable i think it's it's an incredible book oh thank you um I would say I, I agree, but that would sound really, really <laughs> Well, instead of saying you agree, uh, shall we uh, tell people where they can go and get it uh, and uh, and where they can find out more about you? Um, well, uh, of, of course. Well, if you want to get the book, obviously, um, you should go to, to the Hadean Press website. Um, there are two editions of it. There's the, the, just the regular paperback. And for the first time, um, the Hadians are making a limited hardback edition. So I'm, I'm honored by that. I, I was the first author to get a, a limited edition Hadian press book. Uh, and then I guess outside of the Hadians, you major retailers will have this. Amazon has that book. Sure. So you, you and Cortez get a hardcover. That's great. Yeah, yeah, we, we get honored a hard cover. Um, um, about myself, I don't really have a website. I have an academia.edu page where I, I post most of the stuff I published. Um, I, I, don't, I don't offer all of it. I mean, I have my, my books in there, but they're, they're not there. Just reference to them. And, um, and of course, there's the Patreon page. Uh, which is my basis for uh, working on my new Cyprian book, which should be coming out. I'm hoping, like I said, I'm hoping to finish it in, in, in weeks. And then a year or two later, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to come out. 
Um, so yeah, you, I, I guess you can find some information there too. But that, that's pretty much my only online presence. Those two websites. Wow. Um, once again, congratulations. I will have all of this stuff linked up in the show notes. But uh, this is a fun book. You've you've done it again, Jose. And uh, and I always love talking to you about these things. Yeah, yeah. It's always nice. Yeah. Done. Perpetual Almanacs, Magical Bestiaries, The Impact of Culture and Context on Praxis, and My Own Average Cunning. Check out the show notes for links to Jose's two most recent books, his Academia page, and his Patreon page, which I've personally got a lot of value out of. Speaking of a lot of value, this show is great value at zero dollars, so please do like, subscribe to, and share it on YouTube or in your favorite podcatcher, and if you have a moment, also head over to iTunes, wait 40 minutes for it to load, and review the podcast. And for those of you who caught the announcement about the farm this week on the blog, that little Cyprian time encoder uh, has been added to the original post, which you will find at runesoup.com. You can also get in touch with me there, or you can find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.